Hello everybody and welcome to the Winecast. I haven't done a cast on proper wine science in a while and I thought I'd tackle a subject in this one that comes up a lot in conversations in the wine world but that could still use a little unpacking. Malolactic fermentation. While this cast is meant to stand alone, I have talked more generally about acid and wine in a dedicated cast by that name, and if some of the terms I use in this cast, like total or titratable acidity, or pH, are unfamiliar to you, you can check that cast out for some additional information. That said, let's get started on malolactic fermentation. Or you may hear it called malolactic conversion. It actually goes by a bunch of different names. You might hear it abbreviated to ML, MLF, or MLC, or just called mallow. But the designation malolactic conversion is actually the most accurate of the bunch because, unlike a true fermentation that relies on the consumption of sugar or some other organic molecule, and a subsequent release of energy, malolactic conversion is exactly that, the conversion of one acid, malic acid, into another, lactic acid, with a byproduct of carbon dioxide. Let's have a closer look. Under the influence of lactic acid bacteria, of which there are many strains, both natural and these days cultured commercially, malic acid, an acid most familiar to people as the key acid in green apples, is converted to lactic acid, an acid found in cultured milk products like yogurt and kefir, and also the compound that gives sourdough bread its sour taste. The process that this happens through is called a decarboxylation, and looking at a more full transcription of the chemical formulas for these two acids, What's going on is that a carboxyl group, or a group made up of a carbon, two oxygen, and a hydrogen atom, like you see here, is being removed from the molecule and replaced by a hydrogen atom from that same carboxyl group that adds a hydrogen atom to the CH2, or methylene group, and changes it to a CH3, or methyl group, while the remaining members of the carboxyl group, the carbon and two oxygen atoms, now expresses CO2, or carbon dioxide. And it's this carbon dioxide that explains why this process is thought of, erroneously, as a fermentation. Because even though two different processes are involved to get there, both malolactic conversion and conventional fermentation result in the release of carbon dioxide and thus resemble each other, if only superficially. Since it's a chemical process involving bacteria that the grape juice can come in contact with naturally, malolactic conversion goes back to the very beginnings of winemaking. But, as with so much else involved in wine chemistry, the mechanics of the process weren't fully described until recently, and in Mallow's case, this didn't happen until the early 20th century. Its role in winemaking is essentially threefold. First, it deacidifies wines that undergo it, lowering the total or titratable acidity of the wine by 1 to 3 grams per liter, and raising the pH by up to 0.3 units, both of which, especially at the upper end of the range, represent a substantial drop in the acidity of the wine. What determines how big a drop in acid there will be? Well, a few things, but an important one to take note of is the fact that malic acid varies in proportion to another important acid in grape juice, tartaric acid, that's unaffected by malolactic conversion. Like I mentioned in the cast on acid and wine, in some varieties there'll be a fairly even split between malic and tartaric acid, but in others the difference can be as large as two-thirds tartaric to one-third malic. Also, unlike tartaric acid, malic acid is consumed by grapes as an energy source during ripening, with very ripe grapes ending relatively low in malic acid, and wines made from such grapes feel the effect of malolactic acid conversion differently than wines made from less ripe grapes with, unsurprisingly, the effects of mallow being most pronounced on wines made from juice that was high in malic acid to begin with. Malolactic conversion affects the tactile properties of a wine, with tasters reporting that wines that have undergone mallow have a rounder or smoother mouthfeel than those that haven't, though the precise mechanism that underlies the sensory experience still isn't fully understood. By contributing to the production of esters and other aromatic compounds, mallow also affects the flavor and aroma profile of wines that undergo it, with the specific effect varying from strain to strain of lactic acid bacteria, as well as being influenced by the conditions that mallow was conducted in, but with some of the post-mallow properties in reds identified as stronger red and dark berry notes, as well as chocolate notes and a general roasted quality. Dried fruit and nut notes are often reported in white varieties that undergo mallow as well as a pronounced buttery quality that's the result of diacetyl, a byproduct produced by lactic acid bacteria, and, in fact, one of the two compounds that gives butter its unique flavor. 
Finally, putting a wine through malolactic conversion eliminates the possibility that it'll go through mallow in the bottle, something that, at best, would just leave the wine a little fizzy, and at worst, would leave it cloudy, filled with residue, and smelling sharply of sauerkraut, since, fun fact, lactic acid bacteria are also the same bacteria that turn cabbage into sauerkraut. What wines go through mallow? Well, a large majority of all quality red wines made for commercial consumption do, with the only exceptions being cases where a truly acidic, bright, and relatively uncomplicated style is what the winemaker is looking for. Some estimates suggest that around 20% of whites go through mallow, and that number seems to be rising. The flavors and aromas produced by mallow are generally thought to play better with certain white varieties than with others, and Chardonnay is probably the variety best known for having an affinity for this process, while other whites like Chenin Blanc and Riesling are almost never put through it. This process is also no stranger to sparkling wines, perhaps no surprise, since a lot of sparklers, particularly traditional method sparklers, are made from mallow-friendly grapes like Chardonnay, though of course many are not. Finally, how does malolactic conversion happen in the first place? Well, it can, and for most of wine history did, occur naturally thanks to lactic acid bacteria being ambient where wines were made, and in fermentation in storage vessels like barrels and clay jars. These days, though, many winemakers prefer to inoculate their juice or wine with specific, often commercially prepared, strains of lactic acid bacteria, since different strains will produce different effects on the finished wine, and inoculating gives winemakers more control over those effects. Malolactic conversion usually doesn't happen before fermentation, but it can be initiated by inoculation during fermentation, in which case it's called co- or simultaneous malolactic conversion. Or it's done after fermentation is complete, which is called sequential mallow. Both of these options have supporters, but there seems to be a preference among winemakers for sequential or post-fermentation mallow, but this may be changing as some evidence is beginning to suggest that simultaneous malolactic conversion can intensify the fruit character of the finished wine. Malolactic conversion can be arrested, prevented, or otherwise controlled by various means, including the use of sulfur dioxide, something that lactic acid bacteria are very sensitive to, by lowering the temperature of the wine or juice to suppress bacterial activity, and by filtering to remove lactic acid bacteria. Lastly, some winemakers will put a wine through malolactic conversion only to reacidify it afterwards, and while this might seem counterintuitive at first glance, keep in mind that a winemaker may want the sensory properties that mallow can contribute to her wine, but perhaps because the grapes were very ripe or for other reasons, the mallow left her wine with less acid than desirable. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. There's actually a lot more to say about mallow, both on the technical side in terms of the very specific parts of the process, and on how different strains of bacteria affect finished wine, and on the philosophical side in terms of the legitimacy of using the flavor-enhancing properties of these bacteria to deliberately craft wines with a certain sensory profile. But in the interest of brevity, those can wait for another cast. Meanwhile, I hope this cast was both interesting and helpful to you, and if it was, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks to everyone who's taken the time to watch any one of my casts and to leave a comment, and please feel free to speak your mind again since I love hearing from you. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.